Hey, Jeff Gibbons here with another synthesizer video, and in this one, I'm going to be going over the Korg Minilog. This is a really cool piece of hardware. It's affordable, you can pick one up used, or you can go buy one brand new and not have to spend that much money. What I want to do is walk you through the basics of the Korg Minilog. I want to show you how to create your own patches, see what the different controls do, get a good understanding of that, and then be able to download other patches and know what you would need to tweak to change a parameter just slightly, you know, to make it your own sound. Make sure you have watched my Synthesis Basics video, so I'll put a link to that in the description. So for starters, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to patch 200, which is just a basic patch. There is no changes happening right now. So what that means is we've got a basic sawtooth wave. Any of these other knobs for now are going to be at a default state. Basically like everything is kind of turned off. So in order for us to have any of these parameters start to take effect, all we have to do is move them. So we could take the filter and just start moving it. Doesn't matter where it was when I chose that initialized patch, it's going to behave as if all of these knobs are at zero. So it's kind of a nice way to start. I don't have to go and adjust every single knob and set it back to zero. I just need to start moving it in order to start working with it. Let's look at the different sections that we have on the Korg Minilog. So we start over, we've got the master con volume control over on the left hand side. We've got a tempo, which would just control things that are beats per minute based and there's some things like delay and LFO that you can set to the te to a tempo so you get to choose a tempo. We've got an octave control and it's just a toggle that we can very quickly switch between different octaves. We've got a pitch bend and other control right here. We've got that set up to be two semitones. You can go in and change that in the, in the settings of the cork as well. But let's go back to the oscillator section now, and we can see that we've got two different oscillators in the Korg Minilog. Now, this first oscillator is the only one that's on right now, and it's not until I adjust the oscillator number two here that we'll start hearing the second oscillator. So for now, I've got one oscillator. If I turn it all the way off, we don't have anything. So let's listen to the different waveforms that we've got. The first one we've got is a sawtooth wave. And if I look at it over here, we can see the sawtooth showing up in the oscilloscope, which is a really neat way to give you kind of quick feedback on what your waveform is doing. We've got a triangle wave. Here we can see the triangle wave and a square wave. Let's put it back to the sawtooth. We've got a pitch control. We can actually see the sense showing up on this little display, which is another really nice little thing to have that kind of visual feedback, which you don't have on a lot of analog synthesizers. And then we've got something called shape. And the shape is going to change the shape of the waveform that you are on. So for sawtooth and triangle, you're going to see that, that sawtooth, you're going to see that wave start to, to morph as you turn this shape knob. And if we watch the EQ window here in Cubase, we're going to see that it's going to play with the harmonics of our sound. If I change, if I change this shape knob. And so you can see on the EQ that it's adding a whole new set of harmonics just by changing the sh this shape control. So making a much more complicated waveform than we have just with the regular sawtooth. Next we've got triangle. Let's change the shape of that one. Again, adding more complex harmonics, which makes the sound a little bit different. All just ways to create different sounds, different tones. And then let's go to the square wave and we'll see that the shape knob here acts like pulse width modulation, which is basically just changing the, the up and down cycle of the square wave. So instead of it going perfectly up and then perfectly down and perfectly up, it's going to be up for a shorter time and down for a longer time, just creating a different sound. We can see it right on the oscilloscope if I play with the shape until it disappears. Of course, if we modulate that later, that'll sound really cool. So that's the different controls on the oscillator. Now to turn the second oscillator on, all we have to do is turn the volume knob on this oscillator. And now the mini log goes, all right, I am going to add this oscillator to whatever you're doing with oscillator one. What we could do now is we could change the wave. 
of oscillator two. We can change the octave. Now I can go to the pitch, and as soon as I touch it, this knob will be registered. So let's go. So now I'm at exactly the same pitch, but as I change it up. So now we're at a fifth. Let's see what happens if I just turn the volume down. So you can see how all of this stuff is changing the, the harmonics, making a more complex waveform. So with oscillator two, you can simply have it as another wave that plays at the same time as your first one. Or we can go down to these other controls and make a few more changes. Cross modulation refers to the ability of one oscillator to modulate another. So the actual waveform itself is causing the modulation. Just play around with that a bit. Make sure you have two oscillators on. Play around with it a bit and play with the pitch. This pitch EG intensity refers to applying this envelope right here to this oscillator right here. And this one works at a plus and minus kind of fashion. So if I go up, it's going to apply this envelope in a positive direction. And if I go down, it's going to apply in a negative direction. So right in the middle is no change. But as I raise this up, now this envelope here is going to be affecting the pitch of this oscillator. So let's try that. Let's turn oscillator one right off. This only applies to oscillator two. And then let's play with the attack. But that's what pitch EG intensity controls. Put it back to zero. And what sync refers to is the ability to have two different oscillators and one of them will determine the cycle. So you can think of a, a, a triangle wave going up and down. And then if you have another oscillator that is actually at a totally different cycle, it will reset every time that first oscillator starts at zero. So it'll sync one oscillator to the other one. So watch what happens if I have sync on. As I go positive and negative with the pitch, it doesn't actually change the pitch because what sync does is it keeps things at whatever pitch the first oscillator is at. So it's a neat control and can give you some of that gritty, sort of edgy sound. If I go to, to a saw wave. And that's where you can get some of that really aggressive crystal method kind of stuff, you know, that was popular way back in the 90s. And then this ring here refers to ring modulation, which we will leave off for this video as well. If you want to try it out, just make sure you play with the pitch as well. You're going to find drastically different sounds as you play with the pitch. And then last thing we see in the oscillator section is the noise. So if I crank this up, let's put it to something a little bit more pure. I'm going to reset this whole program. Now we're just onto one oscillator. We've got a sawtooth wave. I'm just going to add some noise. And that one is actually fascinating to watch on the EQ window in Cubase as well, because you'll see all of this just noise floor come up in the EQ window. Let's make a little bit more complex sound. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to turn on the VCO2, both of them. And I'm going to actually turn on that sync one. So let's go over to this section right here, which is the filter section. We've got a low pass filter. So starting all the way to the right, we're going to filter all the frequencies all the way down to nothing. So that's our filter cutoff. Next we've got filter resonance, which is going to cause that boost right before the cutoff point. So more of a boost the more you turn it to the right. And then we've got an EG intensity or envelope generator intensity. So we can then also apply this envelope right here to this filter. Let's get there in just one second. So the next thing we've got is a four pole and a two pole. If I put it to four pole, it's going to be a steeper slope of a drop off. So it's going to be a more aggressive filter than two pole, which is going to be a little bit more of an angle. So a quicker drop off on the four pole and a, a longer drop off on the two pole. So let's go to key track. We've got three settings on this one. This is off, 50%, and then 100%. And basically what that means is as you go up the keyboard, the filter will open up. Versus off. 
but what it means is your filter kind of opens up as you get higher. So you might have a more filtered lower frequencies on that patch and as you go up the keyboard it gets louder, high frequencies get louder, the harmonics get louder and it just becomes a more aggressive sound. Uh, let's go to velocity. Velocity again three different controls and with that one it just means does the filter open up if you press the key harder or does the velocity have nothing to do with it. Play lightly, play hard, it gets, it opens the filter up. You can just get more aggressive the harder you play it as opposed to, you know, grabbing the filter and opening it manually. So now let's look at the amplifier envelope generator. And with this one, what we are going to do is we are going to be controlling the amplitude with these four controls. So watch that other video of mine to make sure you understand how ADSR works because this is a confusing topic. Of course we've got the attack so we can have a really quick attack like it's always that's kind of the default state and a quick release. So if I set my release to really short this is what the patch has been the whole time. Set it long. Attack really long. So that's how you would create pads, set a nice long attack. And then we've got the DK, how quickly does it go down to the sustain level. Set it shorter. And let's set the sustain really low so we can hear it drop down to that sustain level. Let's set the attack and decay longer. Okay, you can really hear that. Set the release nice and long. So now let's look at the envelope generator. What does this one do? Well, we can have this envelope generator apply to the filter. We can also have this envelope generator apply to the pitch. So let's try it with the pitch just for a second. I'm going to set the attack up and I'm going to move this And remember, I've got sync on right now, so it's not necessarily changing the pitch of this VCO. It's actually going to just change the character of the sync setting that I've got it set to. So if I set the attack even longer. Pretty cool. Let's change that one back. Let's turn sync off for a second. And set our two oscillators to be the same note. And watch what happens. the pitch, this envelope, this attack, this slow attack is changing the pitch and then dropping it down to a sustained level. Let's turn VCO1 right off. Go faster. Faster DK. So a way to modulate pitch. Let's try, set that back to normal, turn the oscillators back up and turn my sync back on. What about if we apply this envelope generator to the filter? Well, that one, all we have to do is change this envelope generator intensity up. And now this attack is going to control how quickly this filter kicks in. So there's attack, attack, DK. Faster attack, faster decay. Or a long decay. Onto that sustain level. And then the release would be when you release the key. So if we had a long release on our patch, now the filter is closing off as the note is releasing. So let's put it back to our fast release and then let's turn the filter the other way. Let's go for a fast attack, fast decay. So now we hear the filter kind of cutting in and then coming off, cutting in and then coming off before it was opening up and then closing the other way. Now let's look at the LFO. So if I put an LFO onto shape and put crank the intensity up, that's like turning the shape knob over and over again at a consistent cycle. The one that makes the most sense is if I go to pitch right here and it's controlling the pitch of oscillator one right there. Let's change the rate. Sawtooth, 
triangle and square. And of course, what is the square going to do? It's going to be like a siren. Now I could take that and apply that to the filter cutoff as well. It's the exact same thing as going, but we're just letting the LFO do it for us. And what we can do with this EG mod is we can use the envelope to modulate our LFO, which is maybe getting a little bit too complicated, but let's not worry about that for now. Hopefully that is enough of the LFO to get you going, play with the LFO section. And then over here on the right, we've got this delay setting. So what that does is allows you to have a delay effect. Turn the feedback down. And I can control the time of the delay. So next we've got just a couple other parameters to look at in this video. And what we've got here is something called voice mode. Let's just go over some of the basic ones. If you have it set to poly, you get to be able to play up to four voices at once because it is a four voice synthesizer. Duo allows you to have two slightly out of tune notes at the same time. The thing you need to know with this one is for each mode, this voice mode depth is going to change some parameter. So for the duo mode, this one becomes really important because it's your detuning of those two voices. It's kind of like a, the same control that you'd have on a unison. And with unison, it's only one voice, so it's monophonic. But watch what happens as I crank up the voice mode depth. So it really thickens up the, the notes with four voices of detune notes happening at the same time. And if I go to mono, this control adds a sub frequency or adds sub frequencies below the one you're playing really gets a nice thick sound, monophonic sound. So that's probably going to be your favorite setting if you're looking for a really aggressive synth lead. And then other than that, we've got some other things like chords and a delay that actually makes a delay with a voice, an arpeggiator and a sidechain option, which we could look at in future videos. But I think this is enough to get you going. The only other thing I'd like to go over in this video is how to save a patch. And I find this is a really important uh, control because you've just gone through, you've made some unique settings for the Korg, and you'll want to save that as a patch so you could call it up at any other time. And the, the thing with this device is it only has 200 slots to save on, but the cool thing is you can use this mini log sound librarian from the Korg website. And what you can do with that is you can make your own patches, save them in there, and then you can save them as your own library. So you could make as many libraries as you want. You could share them with other people. You can go and buy patches online from people. So as you make your own patch, you're going to want to save them. So here I've got everything pretty much empty. I'm going to go all the way to uh, patch 199, and I'm going to save this patch in slot number 198. So you're just going to look for one that says init program, save it as something else, right? So what you need to do is click edit mode. And then once it's on program edit, you don't have to click anything else. You're going to click one of these blinking red buttons. So you click the first one and you can see right off the bat, it lets you choose a name. I'm going to go like this. I'm going to just change it to J knit program. And then I'm going to click write. And when I click write, it says, where do you want to write this? Do I actually want to write it on 199? That's the nice thing. You don't have to worry about what patch you're, or what slot you're actually on. Because here I can go, no, let's write this patch to 198. So I click 198 and then I hit write and it goes to complete. Now, if I go over to the sound librarian, I'm going to see all of my patches for the mini log right in this window. And here we can see I've got some of the default ones, but if I go to the bottom, you can see that at patch 198, it doesn't show up. It doesn't show that I've changed something. But watch what happens if I look at these numbers. I go to 199, it's normal. If I go to 198, it says JNIT program. And there's my patch, the one that I just made. Now, how do I get this name to pop up in my sound librarian so I can save it on my computer? Then I don't have to worry if I accidentally mess around with this and change the settings or if somebody else does. 
The way we do that is we go to receive all. So if I go to receive all, or if I just go to receive program, I could go receive program here on slot 198. I go receive program, and now we see JNIT program just pops up. So why did I call it JNIT program? Well, it's because it's way easier to type the name on the computer than it is on this with the fiddly little controls. So now I can go in here, I can change this JNIT program to Jeff uh, Demo 1. I hit save, we can see some of the parameters on it right there. And now what I can do is I can mess around with this patch. I could go and change it, make all sorts of changes to it. But first what I'm going to do is I'm going to go file, save, and I'm going to save this entire set. So right now, when I choose save, it's saving it under Jeff's first set.mnlg lib, L-I-B. So that's the kind of file that it's saving. I could save this as an entirely new one. I go file, save as, and let's call it uh, Jeff Experiment. I could go in, I could mess around with this one here, make some changes, and then go write this patch. Where do I want to write it? Let's write it to patch 197. Hit write. I just wrote this patch to 197, and they're both going to be called JNIT programs. So now I go to 197, I go receive program, and then let's call this something else. Demo 2. And now, I look over here and I see 198 says JNIT program, 197 says JNIT program. The reason is the Korg still hasn't received the message that we've renamed this patch, but in order to get it to show up on the Korg, I click on that patch and I go write program on there and write program on here and it receives it. And then sure enough, I've got Jeff Demo 2 and Jeff Demo 1 has just shown up in the Korg. If I close the computer, take this Korg somewhere else, those patches will still be on there. So it's a really easy way to save all your patches, to archive them on the computer. And in future videos, I'll show you how we can map these parameters or control these parameters in a program like Cubase and have all of that kind of information be changed or automated in real time. It's a really beautiful way to work with these synthesizers and takes them from a piece of hardware to something like a crossover of hardware and software, like a virtual instrument. Makes this, this whole thing way more easy to use and also way more likely that you will actually use it. Because that's the thing, is so many of us get pieces of hardware and then we never touch them or we play with them a little bit and then they just sit on the shelf gathering dust. Hopefully that gets you going on the Korg. This is just such a fun device. Definitely worth it if you want to get into analog synthesis for the first time. So. More videos, keep checking the channel, subscribe and hit the bell so that you get the notifications. And thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.